Welcome to Richmond Kickers Weekly. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who hasn't seen a goal in June. <laughs> it's now July. His oh. name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. It's laughter to keep away the tears. It is. I mean, let's not pretend this is not good, right? Uh-uh. The, uh, the kickers have not did not score in June. Let's not um, pretend this is good, right? I can't no, double negatives throw me. Did, was that let's not pretend this is not there's good? There's only one negative. Okay, all right. Let's not pretend all this right. is Making good. Making sure. Um what is the mm-hmm. um depressing stat in terms of how many games since a win? Uh, that I am nitpicking your introduction to the show so we don't have to talk about the game. That's the number one. Uh, number two, uh, winless in eight total games, seven of which... the were, Open Cup. Exactly, yes. Yeah, seven in the league, one in U.S. Open Cup. And then of those seven winless games in the league, six of those would be losses. Yep. And as you've just alluded to, zero goals in the month of June. Oh, so it's, yeah, the recent record is three losses, the draw with Tucson, mm-hmm. three losses just before that, yep. and then go back to May 11th was the 2-0 win over Tucson. I did my research. There we go. I did my research. Our form guide is three reds, one grey, three reds. Yes. Yeah. Um, second bottom, only on goal difference mm-hmm. uh, versus Orlando City B, who are currently bottom. And if you're still listening, you congratu- two weeks. <laughs> congratulations to the seven Richmond Kickers fans who found a way through that one. In fact, I feel like it's probably just like neutrals listening at this point. The Kickers fans have probably already turned off. Well, Kickers fans should mm-hmm. listen because what we have on this show is analysis of the seventh minute goal that I think says a lot about what's going on with the kickers. Mm-hmm. You think that's, am I, am I being too confident? No, I, I think that's absolutely correct because okay. you have both sides of the ball here. You have yep. the kickers on attack and sort of that attack breaking down for a variety of reasons. Then the kickers transitioning into defense and that breaking down for a variety of reasons, yep. culminating in the goal, yep. which happens for a variety of reasons. <laughs> and if you're a Chattanooga fan, mm-hmm. maybe you will enjoy listening because we were really impressed with what yep. Stephen Beatty, the eventual goal scorer, yep. not just with his finish, which was kind of just a scramble at the near post mm-hmm. and he gets there before. For Maxi Rodriguez, his involvement in the entire thing is is really really impressive. Yes. Right, so we've got nice things to say about Chattanooga. We do, we do. <laughs> but let's start with some nice things to say about the kickers. Because yeah, we've been a little bit frustrated by the sort of static nature of some of the possession, moving Slow left to right, right to left. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And here we see a moment where they does seem like they try to mix it up in the seventh minute. Yep. Uh, the kickers have a sort of direct ball over yep. the top. Uh, I think they're trying to find Daniel Jackson. Yeah, but it's, it's a quiet with a direct ball to yeah. Jackson. It's not a terrible ball. Uh-uh. And it, but but it's, it serves its purpose because even though it's headed clear, it's still headed clear by a defender who's dropping back at a rapid pace because they're trying to track the run. So even if that header is one, basically it's headed straight up in the air, drops down, Joe Gallardo is able to collect, yeah. and now you have possession in, the attack, in, the, or in Chattanooga's defensive third. And I want to stop here for a second and say this is a thing that – I think the kicker should do more of, right? Yep. Like, I love the possession game and the slow build up, but if it's not working, if you're not finding way through as a midfield, say when we play Lansing mm-hmm. and they press and there's no way and there's no way through, which is what happened, right? Yeah, go direct. And I think, we all due respect, the quality of centre back in USL League One is such that often you'll get a loose header that you can then collect and possess, yep. right? If Rio Ferdinand was playing, then he would bring the ball down on his chest and have possession and you'd be in trouble. But because of the quality of USL League One defending, usually you've got a really good chance at winning mm-hmm. the second ball and then you can play your possession game and you're already in their final third. Right. And which, that's what happens here. Which is what happens here, right? And so the kickers do a good job. They get numbers four. Joe Gallardo brings the ball down. He finds Eli Lockerbie. Who good, is, calm control from Gallardo as well yeah, to bring this down. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I think it's still like he, he does have to chest it with like almost his neck. That's yeah, how yeah. high up it is on his chest. A little bit of collarbone on it. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> fine. Yeah. Collarbone's legal, I think. Um, but Lockerbie playing left back uh, has made the advancing run up the wing. Yes. Uh, that's allowed Boateng to go more central. Mm-hmm. So now that ball out wide to Lockerbie is on. And again, you've kind of spread Chattanooga out, theoretically at least. And, and we're feeling all positive about mm-hmm. this move. Well, we are, except we know that it ends in a Chattanooga goal. We do so now. less so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and this is where I think you start to see the problems, though. Okay. Because so far, good, good technical contro- control from Gallardo, good direct play, good overlapping runs. But now the runs kind of stop. And we've been talking about patterns of play with the U.S. men's national team and mm-hmm. how we've seen a few of those, not enough as we'd like. Yeah. But here you see even fewer because you see, I think, Retzlaff makes a run from very deep uh, into the Chattanooga box, like, yeah. like kind of cor- towards the corner flag. Like the inside left channel, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's, it's a, per- that's a good run. That's it a is. really good run. It's just the only run that happens. Other yeah. than that, Gallardo is kind of stays static after playing that ball wide. Uh, Boateng standing. Daniel Jackson, I think, is kind of hanging out, making a run, theoretically making a run to the far post if that ball comes in, yeah. and then um, Mwape is around there as well. But yeah. it's a bunch of standing to see what happens next. Yeah, I would argue they're all just waiting for the cross to come yep. in rather than trying to 
move the defenders around, right? Mm-hmm. They, I would prefer to see, if we know what the kickers are trying to do and the way they're trying to play, I would prefer our attackers to be making sort of lateral runs yep. to pull centre-backs this way, that way, and just like unorg- disorganise uh, Chattanooga's defensive setup mm-hmm. instead of just waiting for the cross. Right. Yeah. And, but because they're waiting, they're not moving. And so yeah. it ends up being, I think Lockerbie doesn't have much else. He plays to Gallardo. Gallardo tries to find Retzlaff and does. But this is where you start to see, now you go from patterns of play and sort of practice uh, techniques, it seems, yeah, yeah. to more of like improvisation, which isn't necessarily bad, but when you've got a bunch of people making now... Depends. You, there's some good improv and there's some bad improv. Exactly. I've been to see both. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Can I get a suggestion? No, I'm just trying to think of like, the worst suggestion possible. Like, uh, but yeah, instead, I'll just keep talking about this one. Uh, because Yeah, my suggestion is keep talking about this game. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, but like because Lockerbie, I think, is kind of uncertain if he should make a run like around the back, just in case there's going to be a ball in behind, or if he should like sort of come central, I think he just kind of ends up deciding, I'm going to go in for like a quick combination pass as Gallardo plays to Retzlaff, and then it just ends up being confusion because now there's two kickers players in one spot. And I'm, I'm not thrilled with what Lockerbie no. does here. I mean, I've been enjoyed his play for the kickers mm-hmm. so I don't want to like get da- too down on him but he essentially runs straight at Redslaff mm-hmm. and like tries to take the ball off him you see him just dangle his left foot in there as if he's gonna not tackle Redslaff but just like relieve him of the ball and yeah. carry on mm-hmm. which Redslaff wasn't on the same page which mm-hmm. I, I also think it's kind of a disrespectful thing to do to another player yep. and it's not that helpful because <laughs> what what Lockerbie maybe should have done is just gone wide again and maybe then he pulls some people out of Redslaff's way yeah right like open open them up a little bit um so yeah I'm not thrilled with Lockerbie's run here nor am I and I'm and I'm doubly not thrilled because then he clearly is calling for the ball from Retzlaff Retzlaff tries to play it to him and it's cut yeah. out by Chattanooga tries to force it right yeah he does and I know like Retzlaff is a professional player at this point so you know you got to deal with some of this but I have to believe that that's Lockerbie screaming that he didn't get the ball in that layoff right away so now he really wants the ball and we've both been in that position of if you have a person screaming at you that they want the ball right now right now right now you feel that pressure to play it even if you know it's maybe not the best idea yeah but Lockerbie should know that he's not in the best spot right because he gets behind two defenders I think he's still on side but there's no gap to play between those two defenders and he's essentially peer pressuring Kretzlaff mm-hmm. to try and play the ball between two defenders. Yep. And obviously it gets blocked. Chattanooga counterattack. Chattanooga score. Yes. That is what happens next. It is. And it's really That's impressive very short to me. Version. It is. Are we done? Should we call <laughs> we're, it here? We're not Stop done. the recording? There's a lot more to talk uh, about. North Texas SC this weekend. And thanks for listening. <laughs> No, should we keep going? All right, fine. Um, When David Bieler was in here at the beginning of the season, uh, Richmond Kickers head coach, he talked about one of the things that maybe they were looking at doing, I believe this was then, was like switching play fairly quickly. That instead of kind of making like slow build up from right to left, it would be like quick changes of changes of yeah. space in order to overload or create confusion. Yeah, because you pull people to one side, then you switch to the other side and try and get them there. And, yeah. and I think the, the other key thing, because we're getting to what Chattanooga do really successfully here. <laughs> it's that, is, isn't it? It is, but it's... But it's how quickly they do it at times when it doesn't seem necessary, if that mm-hmm. makes any sense. Because like uh, it's BT who starts it. I think it's BT in terms of pronunciation. Yeah, he's the one that um, comes away with the ball after uh, after the Retzlaff pass right. is blocked. Yeah. I just mean, is it BT or Beatty? Is, oh. it one of the, is it a Warren situation or is it a BT situation? I think it's a BT situation. All right, we'll go BT. Yeah. Um, so BT gets the ball, and I, I think you pointed this out. He has, what, like 20, 30 yards of space in front of him before Maxi Rodriguez, who's sitting in yeah. like as the left back. And instead, he chooses to switch the ball across the field. Yeah. And if you're another team who's maybe just like counterattacks on, let's go, you just run as fast as you can at Maxi Rodriguez. Because Lockerbie is mm-hmm. all the way up. And yep. I think after he didn't receive the pass, he hopped up and down for he a did. second. He was mad. <laughs> Which, you know, I get. mad. But he's, he's out of position. Mm-hmm. So there's a chat, and Maxi Rodriguez is filling in. There's a yeah. chance to exploit that that side yeah. of the field, right? And it's kind of weird on first watch that BT doesn't take that opportunity. Right. But then when you see what happens, yeah. which is a long diagonal. Like kind of more lateral than diagonal, I guess I should say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but that almost ends up being uh, very successful. Yeah. Because he's going to Cisse number fifteen. Thank you for seeing me staring frantically at my notes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it's Cisse and Cito doesn't make this sequence uh-huh. very easy. Um, but I think this is where you start to see further breakdowns. So we've gone mm-hmm. from the kickers playing like direct and successfully, yep. and now we're slowly going down. Yeah. And this oh, is. And I would argue the attacking breakdown is in part because of a lack of communication yep. between. Um, uh, Retzlaff mm-hmm. and Lockerbie. Yep. Just just noting that because yeah. there'll be some more communication later on. Keep, keep that in mind, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so here we start to see once the breakdowns begin to occur, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's your next big one. That long ball from... It's like a domino effect, but each domino is slightly bigger than the one before. And sadder. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that, but that cross-field ball, uh, Ainscoff, the Richmond kicker's right back, steps to try to win, uh, goes for the challenge in the air, misses the header. Does he go for it? I feel like he d- decides not to go for it. At His the last body second. goes for it. Yeah. 
He's not fully committed to no. it at all, mm-hmm. right? And essentially, he misses it and he does. So he gets the ball. Yeah. He does. And instead of... It's a of, bad decision to go that far up the field and yep. not even make the actual challenge. It certainly is. And now the Richmond kicker's right back is out of position. So obviously, if you're Chattanooga, you just attack as fast as you can down the left, except you don't. What you do <laughs> is you dribble back into the middle and play a ball wide. And so now you've switched and then switched again. And so if you're the kicker's trying to transition, now you're yeah. further pulled out. They're unbalancing mm-hmm. us, right? They're pulling us all over the place. Yep. The really great thing about this uh, lateral ball from Cisse is it looks like it's going to beat it. Who, mm-hmm. again, number 10, we're really impressed with him for Chattanooga in this sequence. He fakes like he's receiving at the last second. He, it's almost like yep. he's got to the edge of a cliff. Olé. And he, and he yeah. stops, lets the ball run past mm-hmm. him, and it runs outside to, I believe, Pineda, you got number it. 14. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Pineda has all kinds of space. He does. Uh, and he does because, again, Maxi Rodriguez is not your usual left back, yeah. but is sitting in. Um, but now you do have Lockerbie getting back into yeah. position. Sprinting hard to get back, to, to give him full uh, credit. Eventually, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, I think he, he doesn't get to full sprint until... I mean, we still have time for the ball to switch to one side of the field yeah, and yeah. back to the other yeah, before yeah. he's back in frame. Yeah. But I take your point. Um, but so then this is where you have a confusion. Yeah, because Lockerbie trying to get back into position, Maxi wanting to get back into his more central midfield role. And so they're both focused on that, not focused on putting... Uh, pressure yep. on Pineda so now he has time to pick his head up yep. and play another cross field pass and the cross that causes the goal comes from Pineda and he makes the cross during essentially the change of shift yep. between Maxi Rodriguez mm-hmm. and Lockerbie as Lockerbie's getting back in position and Rodriguez is getting back to midfield like the next step would have been then Lockerbie steps to yep. Pineda but it's too late, right? Because he's already had all this time and space. It's like it's like Pineda robbed the factory during the shift change. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you want to watch some some heist movies? Um, actually, I've been watching Late Night. Um, and Mindy Kaling's character um, mm-hmm. originally works at a chemical plant, which people keep calling a factory, and she uh, gets in big arguments about it. I wish I hadn't asked. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I recommend that movie, by the way. It's excellent. <laughs> I like Mindy Kaling. Uh, who's the other lead in that one? Emma Thompson. Okay. Plays like a late night talk I'm gonna, show. I'm going to take us on this path. And uh, North Texas this weekend. Thank you for listening. <laughs> um, no, so And again, for the third time now, we have so Pineda, who has a left back who's trying to get back into space, a center midfielder who's trying to get back into center midfield. Now there's like 10, 15 yards of space. Yep. Again, we have seen, if that's the kickers, now we're in that scenario where maybe Lockerbie tries to drive through with that ball to get into the box to see what happens. Yeah. And instead, Pineda holds up yep. and plays that ball back across. And one final note I'd like to make just on mm-hmm. this little moment, we're really going frame by frame here, yeah. right, is I would argue that's a lack of communication mm-hmm. between Lockerbie and Rodriguez as well. They, or at least one of them should have made the decision that switching positions is not the most important thing here. Right. Getting pressure to the guy with the ball is the most important thing here. So someone should have either told the other one or made the decision to go to Pineda instead of being focused on getting back to left back and getting back to centre mid. That's my opinion. I I think it's the right opinion because Pineda has all this space to pick out a perfect cross. Yeah, I would agree with that. I was also kind of thinking in the moment that if you switched the positions, uh, you could basically be describing the other side of the field and the lack of communication that's happening there. Oh, yeah, there's more about to happen. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Because when that ball uh, comes across, uh, Ainscoff has gotten into position but he has tracked uh, Cissé through the middle. Yep. But now Cito is wide open on the outside. And so, again, you have this moment of, wait, who's supposed to be where and who needs to be marking? Akwe, I think, throws up the hand to say, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got, C- yeah, yeah. I got Cissé. But by that point, the ball is already in the air. And now Ainskov has to kind of panic to get wide to try to put some cover there. And I actually think this is a really good example of um, Cissé, the mm-hmm. number 15, doing the opposite of what Lucky B did at the other end of the field. Like, if you go charging forward, often, like, into the box, mm-hmm. often you make it easy for them to center back to pick you up, right? What Cissé does is he kind of drifts mm-hmm. between Ainscoff and Akwe and never goes, like, he never goes charging into the box. He stays at the edge. So then they're both a little unsure. Like, Akwe's like, he's not quite close enough for me yeah. to pick him up. And Ainscoff is like, he's not quite far enough away for me to leave him. And in the meantime, Cito is sneaking out wide. Yep. Yeah. And so the, uh, the ball arrives. It is settled with uh, Cito's left thigh and then like right hip and then right foot. Yeah, which it's a weirdly I, bad first touch. It is. It, t- it takes it back across and it's so strange that he's able to kind of use his right hip and then his right foot to get the ball back under control yeah. that it looks for a moment like it's a handball. And yeah. then you, this is where we have another issue, which is both Ainscoff and Akwe briefly, briefly, but still stop and put their hands in the air to call yep. for a handball. Mm-hmm. And you know who doesn't stop? Cesar? That would be the one. He yes. continues to play. So now he gets to the end line, crosses it in. But because Ainscoff and Akwe have just held up a little bit to call for that handball, they're now not in a position yep. to make a defensive play and to cut out the cross that and comes in. I would encourage you, if you can watch this in sl- s- slow motion, or yeah. just, you just rewatch it a couple of times, the reason Cito is able to get to the end line and get this low ball in that leads to the goal... Um, 
is Enskov stopping to yep. appeal, right? It's only mm-hmm. a split second where Enskov slows up a little bit, puts his arm in the air, which is not good athletic sprinting position, right? Yep. I mean, yeah, you don't see any Olympic 100-metre runners with their arm no. in the air. They go arms up by the That's side. That's not efficient? It's, no. not, right. it's not efficient, right? No, it's a yeah, day. but just because he slows up to appeal a little bit, there's only so much space at the mm-hmm. end line, right? It's really tight margins. And I think that's the margin that Sito exploits is yeah. the moment of Ainscoff slowing up and putting his arm in the air. Yes. Similar for Aquai, right? He could be getting over to cover that cross mm-hmm. to like cut out the, the cut it out before it actually manages to become on goal. Um, instead, he stops for a second yep. and puts his arm in the air to appeal a handball that we've watched several times. Absolutely not no. a handball. It mm-hmm. goes past his hand and down onto the floor and then he yep. just uses his right foot to cut back the other way and drive yep. to the end line. Yeah, it just, again, it's because it comes off like the right hip but seems to stay like back in the like back into a position that can be controlled whereas it should be kind of popping up in the air because of that it maybe looks like yeah. a handball if you are in a state of transition and a little bit of chaos. Yeah. But yeah, we've watched it plenty of times. It is not. And I, I get appealing for it mm-hmm. but not at the sacrifice of your best nope. defensive positioning. Nope. Yeah. This is true, but it's also true that there's more defensive mistakes here. Oh, because it's as, BT again, right? BT causing yeah, trouble again. It is, uh, because BT is now kind of ghosting into the box. But even before that happens, uh, the left center back uh, for the Richmond Kickers, Magales, in Fershinovsky, who's suspended. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Magales, I think because Akwe now like slides over to cover the near post and theoretically cover that cross in, Magales, I think, automatically moves to try to close the gap between them to keep, keep that space tight. Yeah, keep that shape between the center backs. Which I, I suppose, yeah, I suppose makes sense, except that you're now leaving a massive amount of space at the back post for an attacking player yeah. to drift into, which is exactly what BD is doing. And if you watch the timing of this, like I think Magales doesn't see BT mm-hmm. or sees BT being marked by Maxi Rodriguez. Yep. And the BT's timing is so perfect. It's as Magales starts to go over and leave this gap in the middle, that's when he runs into it. It's absolutely golden timing uh, yeah. from BT. And I feel like, there's again, there's a miscommunication here between um, Rodriguez, mm-hmm. Maxi Rodriguez, and Magales, like uh, maybe Rodriguez should have said, Magales, I yeah. stay, yeah. stay with him. Or um, Magales should have checked with Maxi before he went yep. over to make sure that Maxi was covering. Because there's a moment when he's, again, between two markers and Maxi isn't sure he's supposed to go with him because he thinks Magales is going to pick him up. And then uh, Beatty's able to exploit that indecision. That's why he ends up being, uh, Maxi gets back to him, right? To, to be fair, he makes almost. a sprint yeah. to try and catch up to him. But the reason it's only almost mm-hmm. and not actual is because of that moment of miscommunication. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And and so to bring it, and then BD is able to get a body to it, puts it in the net. It, it's a little awkward, but it counts. Goal's a goal. One yeah. nil, that's how it stays. But I just, I want to like contrast the two there for a moment of think about the kickers with the possession at the top of the box for, of Chattanooga's box and the way Chattanooga kind of hold their shape. They keep their bodies where they need to. There aren't any runs to pull them out of position. There's not any big switches to throw Chattanooga off. So because of that, they're able to kind of just stand there, win the ball. Yeah. Contrast that with the Richmond Kickers at the end of this, who are all sorts of all over the place and stretching and transitioning and trying to slide yeah. across, but trying to mark a player, but trying to communicate at the same time. And you can just see the kind of organization and the lack of a threat to that organization versus the chaos under a threat to chaos their organization. The, chaos is a good word. Mm-hmm. All right, that's the, one of the longest breakdowns of a goal we've ever done. But I think there was so much, like, so, it was yeah. so rich with... Um, mm-hmm examples of what the kickers are doing well yep. and not doing well that it's it's kind of a perfect encapsulation it tells a story it really does tell a story obviously this game finishes 1-0 story of to Chattanooga <laughs> on this goal if you want to rewatch it uh-huh. we'll, we'll put the link to the highlights in the show notes yep. but the USL highlights only show the goal from uh, the crossfield the original crossfield ball from yep. BT in the counter attack is already landing I think you see you see Cissé just received the ball and you see everything from there so if you want to watch just the the latter half of this goal you can watch the highlights if you want to watch the full thing obviously go to ESPN Plus and then like starting like the uh, as we tick over into the seventh minute mm-hmm. so starting at six zero zero, you'll probably see this whole thing unfold this is true yeah, yeah. All oh, right. So you, all that remains to be said is North Texas SC this weekend. I finally get to say you, it. You haven't mentioned it. I have not. Yeah. Uh, 7 p.m. at City Stadium. North Texas uh, did uh, cause the kickers some problems last time. A 3-0 win. Ricardo Pepe did get on the score sheet there. Is no longer with he North Texas. a beautiful goal that mm-hmm. day. It was worth turning up to see that goal. Do we think it was? He won't be there, No, he signed, he signed a pro yep. contract with mm-hmm. FC Dallas. He's, as I understand it, he's with the first team right yep. now. I hope he stays there and doesn't visit Richmond. Yeah, I said sadly because like I want to see up and coming players. Yeah, but, but we've, also, seen him. Exactly. we've seen him now. I've checked that off the list. I don't need to see him against the Richmond Kickers again. Genuine question that I should probably know the answer to. I want to see him don't. against DC United. That's fine with me. Yeah. Um, is last time that uh, uh, North Texas were in town, yeah. that was during the U20 World Cup. So Cervania, uh, Brandon Cervania was with the U.S. Ooh. national team. Do we think he'll be with North Texas this time around? 
I don't know because he goes sometimes he goes back and forth between FC yeah. Dallas uh, and he also may be getting a little rest yeah. after the U20 World Cup. I think, so the answer is I do not know. I think FC Dallas also today I believe sold uh, Goretzo. They're like other holding. I saw Freiburg, right? Yes. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Or Augsburg. Augsburg. Augsburg yes. One of the Bergs. Mm-hmm. It's a Berg. <laughs> Pittsburgh. Uh, <laughs> FC Pittsburgh. Uh, um, yeah. So maybe that means uh, Cervania goes to the senior team. Maybe that means North Texas even weaker and more vulnerable to Richmond Kickers but counterattacks. The thing is, like. Like it's definitely like a one in one out type situation, mm-hmm. and always the next kid that comes up is brilliant. Why you got to <laughs> so do that, Daryl? I'm just saying that even if there's no Pepe that? and mm-hmm. if there's no Savania, there's still going to be um, a lot of talented players for mm-hmm. North Texas SC. So it'll be worth honestly, it'll be worth going to watch to see those talented young players, and it'll also be worth going to watch to see if the kickers fix some of the problems we just outlined in today's show. We shall see. Yeah. 7 p.m. City Stadium yep. here in Richmond, Virginia. We will be there. All right, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to break down this goal with me for right, what, you, close to 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, let's close with the people who never lose the faith. Here's the Red Army. Mm-hmm.